Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for everyone here, Harold, the rest, uh, rest of his team, for such a warm welcome to Vienna. This is my first time in the city and certainly impressed by its beauty and warmth as well. So, so this is where we start. So participation sport is my company, but it's also the topic that I'm going to discuss. Uh, by participation sport, I mean mass participation. So we've already heard some of the speakers refer to events such as marathons, half marathons, colour runs were mentioned, uh, open water swims. That's the area I've been working in uh, for the last uh, 15 years. So hopefully part of this talk you'll be able to uh, see how I as, in a, an, as, a, as a sports events manager, so like Thomas I'm also a, uh, uh, an events a director and manager, but I focus purely on uh, participation sport, uh, getting people active. Uh, I wish I had four million budget, but unf unfortunately, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, don't have that. Um, so, hopefully, you can see how I, as a um, as a, an event manager, sports event manager, can use public spaces, can use existing sports facilities, and can hopefully create an experience that people are going to want to take part in, enjoy, share on social media, and most importantly, pay to, to, to enter. So that's where we are. Um, I'm going to look at three areas. Uh, one of the areas is the power of community. Communities coming together to provide sport for themselves. The example I'm going to sh uh, focus on is Park Run. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of Park Run before. Uh, a couple of people. I'll give you more information about that as we go on. It's, a, it's basically the largest running series in the world. You can also look at the rise of extremists as well. People are going longer and further and multi-sport and multi-day for their endurance kicks. Uh, previously, a marathon was considered a, uh, a feat of endurance. Now people are going far further and I'm going to focus a little bit on that. But I'm going to start on swimming. So this is a, a sport close to my heart. I'm not a swimmer, but I've been involved in swimming events for, for a while. And my belief is that swimming has very much been left in the innovation slow lane. Other sports, such as running, have innovated. They've embraced technology and, in the sports events field, have created new and interesting activities. Colour run was mentioned. Tough mudder is another. These things, these events, bring a new audience to the sport. So, yes, I, I, I agree with the previous speaker. I've never done a colour run, and I don't particularly want to, but the great thing is it brings more people into the sport. If you look at uh, cycling, cycling in the UK has had a massive boom. Loads of new uh, sportive events, distance events, 100-mile events. It's that, those events help drive the participation in the sport. Triathlon as well uh, has had a, a, a la large growth and I what I love about triathlon is they're not, they mould their sport. You know, you can have a, have a uh, in-water start, a pontoon start, or as you saw in the Rio Olympics, a beach start and it, it's fantastic. But I've for a long time uh, thought swimming has been left in the slow lane. In the UK there are no swimming events where the everyday swimmer can participate. There are none, unless you go open water. So there's been a lot of new open water events, often distance, so 10K, 5K distance uh, open water events. But in a pool where 90% of swimming happens in the UK, there's, there's, there's no events to engage the everyday swimmer. Okay? Unlike uh, a couple of weeks ago was the Vienna Marathon, anyone in this room could enter and run at whatever speed in that event. But for swimming, it's different. You, this, uh, non swimmers or people that don't swim often aren't likely to pay to enter the 100 butterfly, for instance, in a competition. So I, I wanted to change that, and this is the story of what I've done. So I create, two years ago, I created Marathon Swims. So Marathon Swims is a, uh, a 10K, uh, a, ha a half marathon 5K, and a 1K challenge. We host it in what I believe is the world's best swimming pool. So the Zaha Hadid designed London Aquatic Centre, which is on Queen Elizabeth uh, Olympic Park in London, where the uh, London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games 
were held for, for swimming. So stunning location. Uh, also uh, nominated uh, for, for a few awards. So 10K is important because uh, the marathon in swimming isn't 26.2 miles. Don't worry, I'm not going to get anyone to swim that distance. Since 2008, in the Beijing Olympics, uh, the marathon swim was introduced. And since then, it's been successfully run in London and Rio. Uh, but it's open water. So what I wanted to do is to reinvent the sport for the, for the pool. Uh, and this next video, rather than me explain it, quick 30-second video, which um, hopefully will just show how it's different, show how I've actually created a whole new set of rules for the sport of swimming. For example, you'll see you get out of the water, which typically in swimming you don't, uh, and how it's, the rules has been adapted so we can uh, build a great experience for the participant. It might take a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to, uh, to go, or I might have to press play. Marathon Swims is the ultimate swimming challenge. Swimming now has its own marathon. Enter the Marathon 10K, Half Marathon 5K, or 1K Challenge. The unique format involves swimming up and down every lane, moving up a lane each time, starting in lane 1, finishing in lane 10. That's one kilometer completed. Exit the water, run through transition, and back into lane 1. When in the transition zone, you can take a break, a drink, or even take a photo with your friends. Cross the finish line, and you are a marathon swimmer. <clears throat> Hopefully, we'll get on to the next slide. We seem to be stuck on this one. I don't want to play it again. Um, so... Hopefully you've seen it's different. You get out of the water. There's a couple of reasons for that. Is that we wanted to provide uh, the participants with real data. In a marathon, in a half marathon, you get your data, your one mile splits, etc. It's the same here. So we've got an RFID chip mat at lane one, and we've got another one at lane 10. So by the time they've gone up and down a, t a 10 lane 50 meter pool and got out, that's a kilometer completed, they get their 1K split. This is transition, so if you're doing a marathon, you're going to need a drink, you're going to need some, uh, uh, maybe a, a bite to eat as well. So you, you can walk, run, whatever you want, through transition and in. Um, so you get your transition time, and then your overall time is the time that it takes you to do the full swim and the transitions, and then cross the finish line. So it's not new technology, it's just using it, and it's in fact the first time ever that uh, RFID chip technology has been used in a pool for a pure swimming event. So we've taken a lot of inspiration from triathlon. So first of all, there's a transition. We also um, don't worry about uh, swim caps, but we have race tattoos. We even have a penalty box for rule violations as well. Uh, so taking a lot of inspiration from that sport just to, to keep it fresh. So. As a startup business and as a startup event, I needed to be very clear on our job to be done. And this is, this is Marathon Swim's job to be done. I believe that we are in the business of pro uh, providing bragging rights. So our participants hire us to provide the medal, the photographs of the event, and the online results, all just to feed their social media boast posts. That's what, that's, what, that's what it's about. And a great example of that is the M. Tattoo. This is a commercial logo that hundreds of thousands of people have voluntarily, permanently put onto their bodies. Uh, so that's what we wanted to, to, to try and do. This is the experience economy, the age of Instagram. So it's important that these online results, these images, are, are, are able to be shared. So the conversation might go, have you been to, uh, have you been to uh, Glastonbury? Have you done an Ironman? Hopefully at, one, at some point the conversation will be, have you uh, done a marathon swim? Just to show, just to prove it, here's some images of our first ever event 
um, of marathon swims. Every, we allow uh, uh, cameras and, and phones on poolside for our event, absolutely critical, because we want uh, this event to be shared. And I just love the top left-hand corner, the guy contorting himself to get his medal, the pool, and the, uh, and the logo in. And that's all in the London Aquatic Centre, which is a stunning, stunning venue. So why did we think this was a, a thing that we could do, a distance swimming challenge? Well, I've already mentioned there was a lot of open water 10K events that are starting to, to crop up, so we noticed that. But we also looked at the Great Swim series. So this is run by the same people that do the Great North Run, which is the world's largest half marathon. And we noticed that their, their event was a one-mile swim in open water. For the first three years, that's all it was. Gradually, other distances came in. So all of those colours at the tops of the graph, they are distances over two miles. So I looked at that and thought, hold on a minute. There's a, there's a massive growth there. So already it's at 38% of swimmers doing two miles or more, and by a couple of years, it will be over 50% of people doing two miles or more in that event. Saying to me that swimmers wanted to swim further. Let's face it, if you can swim to a reasonable standard, a one-mile swim is a lunchtime swim. So hence, uh, Marathon Swims was created. Very much buoyed by the fact that even though in our first year event we had 500 people, last year we had 1,000, and uh, this year we're going to hit 1,500 because we're increasing the number of days that we're in, but buoyed by the fact that some of the, the, most, uh, the, the largest and most respected events in the world started off from very small beginnings. First ever Ironman, 15 people. First ever New York City Marathon, 55. So... Uh, not suggesting we'll ever get to the 50,000 level, but Marathon Swims is built as a series, and we hope uh, to start expanding it to other cities, UK-wide and uh, potentially uh, internationally. We've now got two venues. So this year, we've added a second venue. Unfortunately, in uh, the UK, there are only 11 10-lane 50-meter pools. That's it. Um, so, you know, Esben was talking very, uh, very interestingly about creating uh, different types of pools to, to engage people. Uh, but in the UK, we've got a, a real lack of competition pools. We've got a load more eight-lane 50-meter pools. So to any designers and decision makers out there, all I'd say is if you are considering a 50-meter pool, please make it 10. Because not only is your pool faster than for swimmers, it also enables us to come in and do an event because we need 10 lanes, so. Um, and this is the, the uh, other venue we've got this year. So this is an 85-year-old Lido in Cheltenham. It's 10 lane, it's 50 metre, it's open air. It's only open for six months of the year, but uh, we're really looking forward to our second event uh, at that location. That is Marathon Swim, so I'll swiftly move on to the power of community and park run. So if not many hands popped up when I asked about Parkrun. Parkrun is basically free 5K runs every week at the same time every week. Saturday, 9 a.m., no matter where you are in the country and increasingly the world, go onto the Parkrun website, you will find uh, a Parkrun close to you and you know what time to turn up. No need to book, no need to pay, it's free for everyone, and it's all in local parks. This is the first image from way back in 2004 when the first park run was held. It's Bushy Park in London, and these 13 people are now gods, heroes in the, in the running community. They were the very first people ever to do park run. Uh, now, I, I know the uh, person who started it, and I know the chief exec, so I phoned him up uh, before doing this presentation. And he was kind enough to send me all of their data, it was just uh, not contact data, but you know, all of their participation data. And it was fascinating to see the growth of Parkrun and how it developed. So uh, this is the founder, Paul Sinton Hewitt. Basically, he and his wife and a few close friends started it off. He was a frustrated runner. He was injured, frustrated that he couldn't do his normal running with his running club, so wanted to still be engaged in running, uh, so created Parkrun. 
Originally, as you can see in the top right, it was called Bushy Park Time Trial. So it was basically a 5K time trial, but in just one location. It used to advertise on, in Run As Well traditionally and do flyers like that. The, the difference with Park Run is it stripped out all of the cost and all of the complexity. So there's no runner bib, runner number. There's no medal, you're doing 5K. There's no, there's, there's no medal, and all of the people involved are uh, volunteers. But one thing he did do, he really focused on the data. So the data captured of each individual runner is key, because you as a park runner can go, go back and look at your averages, you can look at how fast you did on any particular event, how you compare to the rest of the park run community. Really uh, powerful stuff on that data. So this is the participation uh, graph. Here you can see the, uh, the first 13 people. And by three quarters of the way through the year, you can see numbers have edged up to around an average of 30 a week, 35 a week. Not looking like a groundbreaking uh, invention at the moment. Um, fast forward a little further and going into the next year and a half, and you can start seeing this weekly participation data getting up to the 100, 150, starts getting interesting. He ran that for uh, three years. It was not until 2007 that he then jumped to multiple venues. So he started with a, because he was getting so busy, he needed another venue locally. So he started another lo local venue, then came on Leeds, so much further uh, away, and then it started to grow. By the end of the year, he had seven events going on the start of the growth. This shows up to today. So you can see this initial growth, and actually for the first seven or eight years, it is, it's, it's growth, but it's tiny. It's now absolutely boomed, and it's gone international. I think the nearest to here, here there's Germany, uh, Poland, it's in Canada, US, it's in South Africa. There was even an event a regular park run event in Afghanistan in Camp Bastion uh, until uh, the troops uh, pulled out. So it's, it's really gone global. Currently none in Austria. And the number of events each, uh, each week, as you can see there, it's up to 1,500. Actually, just quickly flicking back, it's now engaging. This is runners each week, 350,000 people every week. The... Orange bits are the junior events. So on, a, on, a, on, uh, on Sunday, they do a junior event, not 5K, but shorter at 2K. Some of the most proudest things they've actually done is actually take part the park run spirit to uh, other communities. So Sport England in the UK, which is effectively the governing body for all sport, uh, a couple of years ago changed their focus and moved from focusing purely on numbers of participants into actually let's focus our activity around those deprived uh, people who aren't active. That's where we're going to have most value. Park Run took the event to prisons. So this involved, and a prison yard isn't that big, so to do 5K they have to do 14 and a half loops of the same, uh, of, of the same yard. But it's been incredibly successful and some amazing stories have come out of it. So in talking to them, they say that's one of the most proudest things that they've done. But Parkrun's development hasn't been without controversy. So a couple of years ago, there was this story on the left, uh, the council condemned for wanting to charge Parkrun in. So what they, the council wanted to do, and you can see their point, right, you're going to have 150, 250 runners every week on a Saturday at 9 o'clock running around the park. That's going to cause some extra damage to the park we want to be paid. Okay. The park run community <laughs> were appalled at this. Nobody is taking any money here. You know, the participants aren't paying. The, vol the volunteers who are running the events purely do it off their own back. That create created a media storm. And in the, in the end, the, government, the UK government actually stepped in and went, right, no councils are charging park run. <laughs> All right. These parks are to, to, for people to use, enjoy, and exercise in. And yes, there might be a bit of extra damage, but if you're planning a park, then just think, right, well, can we do it with paths that don't have sharp turns? And can we widen the paths? Because that's going to be perfect 
for a park run to, to come in. You also don't need a full 5K loop. Many park runs are four or four and a half laps of the same bit of the park. So it doesn't have to be perfect. Just create the paths wide enough. Um, really interesting park runs attitude to volunteers. So they started out looking at volunteers negatively almost. So it was almost the ethos was let's get as many people running as possible. You know, okay, we could do timing with just two people, so you know, you two can have a run. Uh, they would also they'd see it as a necessary evil, and they'd also be seeing volunteering as people giving up their time. Okay? They soon realise that this is not park run. They've, they've changed it. So now they fully believe the health benefits of volunteering are far greater than actually participating because you're getting social interaction, you're getting inclusion, you're getting friendships created and communities built. So that is stronger through the volunteering than actually doing the physical exercise and running. And so rather than giving up your time, the, the phrase is now giving their time. That's what, that's what people are doing. And they used to, they've still got uh, reward t-shirts for the number of park runs you've done. They've now got reward t-shirts for how many volunteering sessions you've done. Uh, that's it on park run. There's a couple of other examples which I'm not going to go through now, but happy to chat to anyone who's interested. And a couple of examples. Question. So that's, that's insight number two uh, done. The last insight uh, I'm going to share with you is the rise of the extremists. So as I said, a marathon was previously considered a test of endurance. Now people are seemingly going longer, going multi-day and multi-sport for their endurance kicks. And no better uh, example. Does anyone know where this is? No. This is, U this is UTMB. This is Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc. This is in Chamonix. So it's been running about 13 years. It is considered the ultra of all ultras that you want to do. Uh, partly because of its size, but also partly because it's in Chamonix and you've got some extreme um, uh, terrain to, to cross. And it's over, most people take uh, over, uh, over a day and a half to complete it. You're running through the mountains at night. But incredible atmosphere. UTMB have been really clever because they offer points to enter their event to, to other ultra marathons. And to qualify, to even have a chance of getting in, you've got to have done 300 mile events to even uh, qualify to get in. So, where is, uh, so what's the um, sort of research uh, behind this growth? So this is a Triathlon Industry Association in the UK. They've, they've done some comparisons in race participation, and these are the latest figures available from 2017. So you can see the ultra marathons, both in the UK and in the US, have the biggest growth of any race category. The only other category uh, to show both in both markets an increase is the 5K, and I, there's no prizes for award, awarded for realizing why that is. Anyone want to hazard a guess? The 5K is as showing that increase purely down to parkrun. These are not other commercial events coming in. So big growth, in a, yes, from a small base, but certainly uh, big growth. So in terms of ultramarathons, they've been around for years. And, and the, uh, probably one of the most famous and certainly one of the largest is the Comrades. So this is a, an event in South Africa. It goes from Peter Maritzburg to Durban one year, and in the, other, in the next year it goes uphill Durban to Peter Maritzburg. Okay, 89K, 12,000 people doing it. It started off after the, the First World War when some group of returning soldiers wanted to uh, mem uh, uh, remember their fallen comrades, raise some money, and, uh, and do, a, do a, an extreme event. Uh, Old Mutual Two Oceans Marathon is another one that's been around, huge numbers as well. Marathon de Sable, where you're running through the desert for four or five days, another, and UTMB. These are probably, the, the two on the left are the biggest, and the two on the right are probably the most famous ultra marathons. But really interestingly, three of the four are all 
on the content of Africa. Um, so I certainly find that interesting. But there's a new breed of events coming. And these are, are three examples here. So first of all, you've got the Dragon's Back race, the Burkhaus Dragon's Back, across uh, some extreme terrain in Wales, uh, multi-day multi challenge. The Mon Montane Spine Race, this is in January along the Pennine Way in the UK. And hit the headlines this year because Jasmine Paris, uh, a female athlete, won the entire event. Uh, so fantastic uh, story there. And finally, the Transcontinental. So this is a, an amazing cycle race. There's only a couple of hundred pounds to enter. But you cycle from Western Europe all the way uh, to the other side of Europe. There's no route. You pick your way you want to go. All you've got to do is hit certain checkpoints. And the, the leaders and the winners sleep on the roadside for two hours, jump back on their bike, and, and off they go. So there's a growing market of more extreme challenges. I wish this talk was a couple of weeks uh, in advance because I could then share with you uh, an ultra marathon that I'm currently working on. It's, a, uh, it's not launched yet, so I can't uh, show you any detail, but I'm working with a major, um, uh, a major partner to bring an ultra marathon to the city of London. So it's going to be very different. It's not going to be out in the wilderness. It's going to be in the centre of London. So uh, hopefully it uh, will be very interesting. And I'm going to end on the ultramarathon uh, uh, story with uh, the story of, of this gentleman. It, this is uh, Cliff Young, Cliffy. Uh, so ultramarathons have been around for a long, long time. Cliff Young, back in 1983, entered a, an ultramarathon in Australia. It went from Melbourne to Sydney, which is 875 kilometres. Uh, Cliff Young was a potato farmer, never competed in anything in his life, uh, and he turned up on the start line of the ultramarathon in those same boots he's pictured in and wearing normal clothes. He got laughed at on the start line. You had some elite athletes all, all waiting uh, to start. And the race starts, and after the first day, he's a long way, he's a long way back. He's, he's almost at the back of the field. But Cliffy's um, stra race strategy was he wasn't going to stop. <laughs> he was going to keep on going through. And by the, by the end of the first night, when everyone else had, had rested somewhat, he was in the lead. He maintained that lead and won the event by 10 hours. Cliffy was 61 years old when he won that event, that 875-kilometer event. But when you look into his past, what is fascinating, when he was younger, he lived on a sheep farm in the outback of Australia. Huge, huge farm. And his family were so poor they couldn't uh, afford any horses. So he had to round the sheep up by, by foot. So you can see where he developed that, uh, that that's certainly uh, ability to run that far. So that goes back to 1983. And hopefully with a resurgence in ultramarathon running, we can have similar stories and, and similar increase of events uh, in this day. Um, there are my three insights into swimming, into communities, and, and particularly park run and uh, ultramarathon. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.